Multigreen, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multigreen Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Norton. And for this episode, captured at our 2021 annual stakeholder meeting, I hand over the hosting to Jason Bellini, correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He leads a discussion with panelists Kevin Booth, the CFO of the Construction Financial Management Association, Jim Salter, the founder and chairman of the board of CM&D International, and Jeremy Hafen, the president of Clyde Companies. They discuss multiple impacts caused by the rising cost of construction materials and highlight the key role of economic considerations in the supply chain while providing key perspective and experience on meeting the demand for housing today and in the future. Enjoy the conversation. If you've been watching the news, reading headlines today, what is the big economic story right now? Inflation. We're talking about inflation. The consumer price index just jumped 13 or uh, jumped the highest amount since two, since 2013. There we go. I got it. It's becoming a political football. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because the conversation we're about to have, I think this is very relevant. The cost of construction materials. I mean, we're here with, you know, stakeholders in affordable housing, and one would imagine that the cost of materials is going to have an impact on plans for the future. So um, just a very quick introduction, Kevin Booth, he's the chair of the Construction Financial Management Association. Jim Salter is the chairman of CM&D International. Jeremy Hafen is the president of Clyde Corporations. So thank you all for being here. I thought I'd start out by just asking you to give me just a very quick state of play from your perspective. What's the situation like? Am I sort of making a, a, a proper connection here between these inflationary concerns and what you yourselves are seeing? Kevin, why don't we no, start with you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's not unfounded. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, the demand right now uh, for construction is outstripping our supply, uh, specifically in lumber and timber. Uh, uh, I am also t- chief financial officer for Westcore Company, so we're a framing contractor and uh, tend to be the lightning rod uh, for these, uh, the spike in, in lumber prices. It's, a, it's certainly a concern for the industry, and we hope that prices should stabilize soon in this, this market. Where are you buying your materials from, most of them? Uh, we're based here in Las Vegas, uh, in southern Nevada. Um, and it, one of the trends that we have noticed, and primarily we're a residential contractor, uh, and, and more and more, we are finding that our customers are starting to buy material direct. Matter of fact, I, I talked to a gentleman here earlier today that uh, he has a project where the lender has actually required the project owner buy the material in advance before the project even goes forward just to make sure that the material is on site and purchased. So, uh, so more and more, we're seeing this, uh, this separation of material from the subcontractor to the, uh, to the general contractor or even to the owner. Jim Salter. Are you seeing cost overruns? What's your perspective on all this? Not so much uh, cost overruns because of the way we execute our projects, but um, we're seeing massive increases, not just in lumber, but in copper. Um, And we suspect that copper will continue to go up. Steel's going up dramatically. Uh, Transportation costs or another factor that people aren't even considering. Right now, the demand for transportation and and the wars between the farming industry where corn is at its highest price, they want those trains, they want those trucks. And so just just to get a a semi-truck full of of steel and or lumber is now becoming issues, so. I think it's much broader. The other interesting thing, if everybody saw the journal yesterday, in multifamily, we're very likely to lose um, the 1031 exchange, (laughs) which is another cost uh, as it relates to your investor body. Could you just explain that for people who may not know what that's all about? Uh, I doubt that there's anyone in this room that doesn't know what a 1031 exchange is. Yeah, fair, fair enough. 
Yeah, I, 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 just real quick as a, as a primer though, but a 1031 exchange allows you to defer uh, the taxes on 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 a gain that you make on the sale of a property by rolling that into a into a new property, replacement property. And I so think it's, it's very germane to this group because to listen to Randy, uh, we're going to have uh, forty thousand units, and we're going to build and build and build, and not we're not a build to sell organization at multi-green or build a hold so but there is everybody here i promise you will be over 70 years old someday and then you're going to want to look at exit strategies so. jeremy hafen what's the perspective of the supplies guy yeah so i've actually got a couple of slides if they want to queue them up i'm just going to show you something uh, real quick Briefly, it talked about lumber. I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about lumber. Clyde Companies owns a company called SunPro, which is a lumber dealer, and we supply that. Uh, I just I got to bring some humor into this real quick. I don't know if you've seen these, but you know the, the lady asks, "Take me somewhere expensive," and they end up in the lumber yard. Um, another one is, you know, the, the top is eight eight hundred dollars worth of lumber in 2018. The bottom is eight hundred dollars today. What that'll buy you. I think Kevin can do this. And then, you know, as I was coming in this morning, I think I passed a billionaire on a freeway, <laughs> a truckload of lumber. So uh, just to give you another uh, flavor of what the market's doing, OSB, which for those in the, that don't know what OSB is, it's the panels that are on the outside of your home. Uh, it used to be plywood, it's turned it a lot into OSB. It's going back to plywood because of the cost. But a year ago, it was $8 a sheet. Now we're at $45 a sheet. And if you look at studs that go into the houses, same type of thing that's happening. And you know, if you look at it from the from the supply chain, logs from the forest are actually at 10-year lows in pricing. It's really an interesting phenomenon. But the mills are priced, the, these prices have gone up four or five times in the last 12 to 18 months. And I think is what's happened with the supply chain is we're feeling the effects of COVID. Uh, a lot of these mills, uh, decided right in about a year ago in March and April, decided to shut down to preempt a downturn. We all thought it was going down. Everybody was hunkering down and they shut down mills. They laid off people because they couldn't be in the mills with COVID constraints and the opposite in the market actually took place. And so it's this perfect storm that uh, came back to bite us. And so that's, that, I think that's what has caused this increase in pricing. And then second of all, uh, with specific to OSB, the resin that goes in the glue of this product um, is, is manufactured in Texas. And with the storms in Texas earlier this year, it created a blip in the market and the supply. And it's, uh, we're predicting that we could run out of OSB for our customers in the next couple of months um, if, they don't, if we can't get more of that supply into the chain. The New York Times today described the global supply chain as a creaky machine that's coming back to life. I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, is this just a temporary phenomenon that we're just getting back to normal and that we really don't need to worry about this very much? Or do you feel otherwise? I think you've really got to worry about it, but there's a few positives. So I thought I might just throw a couple of positives out there. Um, one positive is it's very likely within the next three weeks, the tariffs on lumber in Canada will be removed. Um, I'm not, I don't want to get into the politics of it. I just want to get into the costs. So, you know, unfortunately our mills are not working even close to capacity, whereas some of the mills in Canada are. And I think that that tariff removal will, will help to, uh, to impact our pricing. No, absolutely. As, as Jeremy said, you know, the, the primary uh, driver of, of the increase in lumber prices today was, was the fact that the lumber mill shut down. So we had this perfect storm. Supply was basically just shut off. Uh, in anticipation, that demand would also fall. But the darndest thing happened during the pandemic. People kept buying homes. I mean, it, it seems like a terrible time to make a life-altering decision like buying a home during the midst of a pandemic. But something drove people to continue to buy homes, sell their homes, and move. So that demand continued. Meanwhile, supply was shut off. And, and like you said, it's a creaky machine. It's going to take a while to gear up and, and get those mills up up to speed to get the supply to meet the demand to bring those prices down. So I say I hope the market will stabilize soon. 
Uh, but the other problem we have is the labor shortage. You know, getting people back to the mills, getting, uh, you know, as Jim said, you know, transportation, just getting truck drivers and trucks uh, to to deliver the materials. So there's, there's a lot of problems with with getting that machine geared back up and running smooth like it was prior to the pandemic. One thing I'd bring up, and it goes a little more to the management side, is logistics. And you you know, you also have to throw in the the economic conditions into your logistics plan. And I work for a number of public home builders. I sit on some boards and what have you, as some of you know. And uh, we are buying futures contracts in certain commodities right now as a hedge for our business. For Which our, commodities? For our businesses. Certainly steel and copper and lumber. And... Uh, I just want to throw this out. Uh, you know, there are opportunities where if you you make a significant enough purchase, knowing that you're going to be building for seven or eight years, and look at that as a potential investment hedge, that you can you can buy futures contracts from suppliers and and or manufacturers and get a significant break. It's always a bet. You know, because you just don't know if it's going to go up or down. But I'm telling you right now, some of our people are buying futures contracts. Jeremy, are the suppliers themselves doing well during this? Are you making higher margins? Is there, I guess, put it bluntly, are there any, is there any gouging going on? Because everyone knows the prices are going up. Yeah, I, I, gouging, I don't think so. I, the logging, I think, I think, is getting squeezed. The mills are making a killing. And the dealers, in general, if we can maintain our percentage of gross profit, we're making a little bit more dollars on the higher price, but uh, not a ton. I think is the mills are the ones that are taking this profit right now. But I think, in, in answer to your previous question, I think it's unsustainable, the trajectory we're on. How it corrects and when, I have no idea. But I'm, it's just unsustainable, and I think I hope that it will soften out, because if not, I think it could put pressure on the housing market and to slow it down and, and you know, we'll create some problems. We there. could see decline in new construction starts, you think? I, I think so. You know, it's anybody's guess, but I think you could see that. I, uh, Multi-green, they're planning to be doing a lot of building. I imagine there'll be consequences for companies like this, that it's just going to be more expensive than they were planning. It's going to be more expensive than they had planned for. Uh, when you're looking you know, 10 years out in the future and trying to come up with your, your business plan and what your costs are going to be, I mean, should you anticipate that these prices are going to be higher and higher in the future? That's a really good question. I mean, if I could predict that, I'd be living on an island on the <laughs> South Pacific somewhere. But um, I, I think if you model the cost appropriately and know what you're getting into, you're going to be, you're going to be fine in the future. Um, but the trajectory and the, sl the slope of this curve on the upward curve is unsustainable. Now, whether it plateaus and then, you know, for a little while and then keeps going or it corrects itself a little bit, that's anybody's guess. Uh, based on historical, I'd expect it to soften and come back a little bit. Uh, may not get down to $8 sheets of OSB again, but hopefully it'll come off a little bit and keep the housing market vibrant. Yeah. It Jim, do you think there's an opportunity here for alternative construction materials? Or is there going to be closer to price parity for some of those? We may be building in a different way as a result of these new commodity prices? Uh, for sure. Um, we, I can tell you that two of the home builders now are looking at a structural foam product. Um, we're also shifting in Montana, of all places, to uh, the, two of our big projects for Williams Homes are going to be metal stud. So, uh, and we're using structural foam as well so that the spacing of the studs can be uh, spaced on 24 inch centers instead of 16. Those are all things that you know, we're doing. Is that a we'll, cost decision? Or is it less expensive to use those materials than to use traditional lumber at this point? For us, it's a combination of two things. We're in a market where we, we put up model homes, four model homes, and sell 70 houses. So we're already sold. 
that price is fixed. That that young buyer has bought, and they got a good deal. Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> I'm not about to go into there, but you know, I'm. I was involved with Schuler Homes going public and selling to D.R. Horton, and even back in those days, we were buying, you know, uh, futures contracts in in rebar and steel. So, um, yeah, I I think uh, I wish I could predict the future. I'd even be wealthier, but you know, I think you're doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you are. Um, so, Kevin, let me ask you this. The, when you're advising companies, what are you telling them in terms of the demand for the future? Do you think that we're going to continue to see a demand for affordable housing in particular, but housing in general in the coming decades? Go macro for us. No, actually, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love residential construction. I mean, our, our the demand is, is constant. I mean, our simple realities, our population is, is the growing constantly. It's, it's not declining. Uh, and specifically out here in the West, the Intermountain West and West Coast, uh, the, the Sun Belt, Florida, Texas, these are areas where we have in-migration as well. So we've got our population growing, we've got in-migration as well. And so the, the, this change in population needs constant addition of dwelling units. And in particular, as, as, as you know, what Multigreen is trying to do is to meet the demand for workforce housing. Uh, that's, that's an area that, that's underserved right now. Uh, and so the, the demand for workforce housing is going to continue to grow. Uh, it's, it's, it's a strong market. Uh, uh, but, but to build that, that affordable workforce housing, we've got to get material pricing, labor prices. We've got to get all of that under control to, to meet that target of, of providing that product. Uh, and we're going to and that, that, that's why we're all here today. We've got, we've got to innovate. We've got to do research. Uh, we've got to work with academia. To, to try to find solutions uh, beyond our traditional uh, construction methods in order to deliver this this housing that's needed. Yeah, in 2008, you know, with the market was terrible. It was just the housing market was a disaster. And Schuler Homes went public <laughs> and grew like crazy. But they were in a market, that, and I must compliment Randy on this, this that we stuck to our knitting. We built entry-level housing, and that demand is, if you took a graph and you said, okay, middle-class housing, entry-level housing, or high-end housing, it's probably 10, 25, and 65 at that lower level. So you're, even in bad times, if you can produce entry-level affordable housing, you're, there's a market for it. There's a gigantic demand. The secret is being able to deliver it and deliver it with my favorite two numbers, a 3X on my equity and 22 IRRs. I won't do a project unless that's my return. So um, that's how I underwrite a deal. It takes me 30 seconds. <laughs> Jeremy, how are builders reacting right now when they find out that the costs that they had anticipated have gone up significantly? Yes, yeah, so we have. We supply a lot in the state of Utah, and uh, the largest builder in Utah, Ivory Homes, Clark Ivory. I talked to him about a month ago, and and he said, "I'm actually shutting off pre-sales right now until we can get this thing a little bit better under control of where I'm at." But a lot of the builders, uh, you know, we're having to allocate a little bit wisely on where we're at. Uh, especially with some of the shortages, and so we're we're being careful who we supply. We're making sure we supply our very best customers, but they are they are we're looking for substitute products um, instead of floor joists in between a level of, of a house. We're we're looking at floor trusses, um, which will help us save on the OSB side of the products. Uh, they're 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 basically increasing their pricing with the increase in materials. They're also not guaranteeing the price of the home to the homeowner at the, on the pre-sale stage. So as what we're finding is they'll, they'll basically say, hey, here's the base price of your house with a lumber contingency in there, depending on what the market does. And when you close, you'll pay for whatever that is. I mean, what are we talking like? Are we talking what kind of percentage additional? Yeah, you know, on an average house, uh, it could be $30,000, $40,000. Uh, $30,000? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
additional based on, at least that's what we've seen in this run up. Now, whether that plateaus or, or continues to go, it's anybody's guess, but you know. I mean, are, yeah. The other thing you're seeing is, is a move back in some in search situations. We're starting to see a lot of post and beam housing again um, to eliminate um, concrete slabs and, and, and post tensioning that we have to do here because of our caliche soils. And I mean, I wouldn't have expected that. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a real big surprise, but people are, are realizing that, you know, you can do a grade beam and a, and a column a lot less expensive than a PT slab now is. And that's a first, and I probably haven't seen it in 20 years. Could we, could you imagine a day when more and more houses are being built without lumber where we switch to alternatives and how soon might that be? I, I could possibly see some, some of that happening. You know, if, if the price increase in lumber is long term, I could see that happening. The short term, I think it's going to be difficult to see. Uh, you know, you've got 3D printed concrete, uh, different types of composites and, and other types of materials that could be used. The framer over here might have a, a better answer to that yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we've mentioned metal stud framing a few times, and that's uh, that. The only reason metal stud has not taken off in residential construction is because it's, it's historically been more expensive than than standard, you know, wood wood frame uh, uh, timber construction. So we are reaching that tipping point in, in the axis where metal stud might make more sense. Uh, and not just because of the price of material. Now, the other problem we have with metal studs is you've also got to train the workforce. So, you know, working with metal studs is completely different than wood studs. So you've got to retrain Not a seamless workforce. transition. No, it's not seamless at all. So, but can it happen? Absolutely. Especially if, if, if you know, the, the market does not correct, if supply can't meet the demand and the price of lumber stays where it's at, we're going to have to find alternatives. And so metal stud could be that, that solution. I agree. Back to the demand question. I mean, how red hot is it right now from, you know, in terms of your experience over the last decade or so? In my case, uh, the housing demand, I'm at 205. I haven't seen this kind of demand since 2005, 2006. Since and 2005. Then, wow. and, and on the multifamily, Interestingly enough, um, the need is dramatic, and the investor uh, profile is in demand. So they they want to be in multifamily for all kinds of reasons. It's easy to finance. It's very easy to finance. Equity is in there, uh, and it's tax deferred profits, and sometimes even tax sheltered profits. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely feels like the housing market before the Great Recession, and, and we all saw that movie, and it didn't end well. Um, it's a little different this time. We don't have those fundamentals. We, we, we don't have the, the subprime lending that, that, that led to that. Uh, and actually, we're not actually building as much as we were then. It just feels like it uh, because we have this huge labor shortage in our industry. And so we're not able to build as many homes as, we, as, as demand is, is, is out there for these homes. And so the, the pressure to build is, uh, is, is immense right now. The, the best word I can find, it's, is, it is immense. And just one other caveat there is, you know, the price of the house has now surpassed the peaks of the 2006, five, six, seven, just barely in the last 12 months. And, and I can see, even though there's demand there, I could see that pricing start to slow that down where people hang tight or whatnot. But um, the demand is there. So from a multifamily perspective, it's, we've got to build, we've got to continue to build. We've just got to figure out how to, how these pricings, how the pricing of the materials normalizes back to a, a reasonable level so that the, it all works out for all the levels of the supply chain. Yeah, and my home builders are basically saying 18 months and then that's it. So 18 months? Yeah, and so all of those people that still need housing, there's only one other place to go and that's multifamily. And the multifamily demand when when residential for sale product hits a certain price threshold will will continue to accelerate. How concerned are you about when you're talking about 
inflation. But we also going to talk then about interest rates going up. Is it possible that this is sort of the time to, to get in because the window may be closing when finance has been so inexpensive, historically speaking? Uh, well, again, on, multi, on multifamily, um, you've got a little more room uh, in for sale product. Five and a half percent is the drop dead number. Um, so, I mean, at least that's what we're, our boards are all um, setting the stage for. Five and a half percent, we're going to pull back because we're liable to build without without buyers at the back end. But on the multifamily, you know, you can still pencil great returns all the way up to close to eight percent. I actually think the low interest rate environment is what's driving a lot of the demand. And so if that pressure, if that goes, if interest rates go up, I think that will pull demand back a little bit and unless and until loan products can extend terms out to 40 or 50 years or, you know, something to offset the, the cheap cost of money at this point in time. And, you know, the Federal Reserve is very careful. They're not raising rates right now. So is there, is there inflationary pressure? Is there not? Uh, the, the rates staying where they're at maybe indicates that that's not necessarily the case yet, but could that change quickly? Absolutely. I'm a professional poker player, and I'll bet you <laughs> that it, we're going to see an interest rise from the Fed in June. In June. Oh, yeah. oh, mark that down. <laughs> huh. no, but, but, and, and, <laughs> and we, June of this year? And so I, could we... A year from now, if we're having this conversation, be saying, well, supply's gone down, or I mean, sorry, supply's come back, but demand has gone down. Is, could, it, could it crisscross in the next year? Well, think about, think about our situation uh, at the border and immigration when you've got, you know, well over a thousand people a day. Where are you going to house those people? Right now, we have 42,000 people living in their shelters. Where are they going to go? They're going to go, and they're going to go live somewhere, and they're going to be a contributor to to the economy ultimately once they get their feet on the ground and they get a job. And so, who who provides the housing for that gardener that we pay 150 a month for, and the pool cleaner, and the people like that? They're still making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and both couples work. That's a hundred. Plus, there's going to be a market for multifamily for a long time. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that, that's the interesting thing about the you know watching mortgage rates as they rise. It, it does, as Jeremy pointed out, it, it drives people to the market. They start to panic and think, "I got to buy now," because you know who knows what the rates are going to be next month or the month after that. So that does drive some demand. But the the other point that Jim just made is that the demand is going to be there regardless. Uh, interest rates could be ten percent, twenty percent. People still need to live somewhere. It's just a matter of where they're going to live. So, you know, it's going to drive them to multifamily. Some of us can remember, literally, uh, people buying houses in the late 70s where interest rates were 15 and 16%. So. Yeah, my, my parents in Arizona, that's, what they were, that's when they were buying into the market. Yeah. Yeah. One other comment, too, and I think it goes along with what they've said is, Really, the demand's going to follow demographics. You know, birth rates. Uh, as as the demographic grows, people will need shelter, and so ultimately, the ups and downs in the market will attach itself to the increase or decrease in, in population. And over and that's time. why I brought up the logistics issue. Everybody uses the term logistics for you know planning your project, but if you could expand that logistics planning to market conditions and economics, I think uh, you'll be much more secure in your planning. I know Schuler Homes, I mean, Jim Schuler's my hero and he made me a fortune. So, uh, but he, he, that's what he always preached was, you know, pay, pay, pay attention for eight, 18 months out. What are we dealing with? What are we dealing with? While we're sitting there designing a product for today. Is multi-green, final question for y'all, do you think multi-green is the right type of company at the right time? 
Yeah, absolutely. As we said, Jim's guaranteed we're going to see a rise in interest rates <laughs> come June. Uh, that's, no, I bet. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Okay, you didn't guarantee. Sorry, wrong word. Uh, but uh, you know, so so as those rates drive rise, it's going to drive people out of the market. They're, they're going to drop out. They're, they're all going to qualify for that mortgage that they qualified for earlier. Uh, so that the, that's going to drive them to uh, this, you know, affordable multifamily projects. And so, absolutely, multi green is in the right place at the right time. And the other thing to take, you know, I, most of my work is on Wall Street. Goldman, Merrill, Paul, all those people are my clients. And right now, they are—I I, I hate to use this word—but they are throwing equity money. At home builders and apartment builders and multifamily builders, we we I've never seen the day when Bank of America and I just closed this deal less than three weeks ago gave five hundred million dollars to a non-public home builder multifamily builder just to expand his business, not project specific, but open cell investing it's just it's hard to imagine yeah and the thing i like about multi-green is you know there's a lot of multi-family developers out there just very opportunistic onesie twosie multi-green has put together a cohesive strategy the sustainability the strategy this niche and the branding that they're trying to put around that i think is very interesting uh, that should serve them well into the long run well gentlemen we're going to wrap up but just very quickly any final thoughts? We've made some, it's been kind of fun hearing some predictions. Any final predictions you want to make as we uh, wrap up this session? Well, if, if, if we're going to go down predictions, I, I am predicting uh, that towards the end of this year, fourth quarter, uh, you know, hopefully we should see lumber prices, you know, a, again, as, as those mills cr crank up, we should see lumber prices stabilize. I'm, I don't know if that's more of a prediction, it's more of a hope than a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe a bet. My comment is on the IDP that we talked about earlier. I thought it was a very fascinating conversation. And I would just like to caution you on IDP in one sense. And that's, you, you know, you, your participation should be collaborative across the board. But, but decision making has to be at the top. So you, to me, the IDP is you collect all the data from your consultants and your suppliers and your contractors and what have you, and you just keep saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but can't we do this, can't we do that? But one, there is this ultimate time when um, collaboration has to stop and decisions have to be made, and you got to make sure that the person at the top is making those decisions and not the architect. Uh, and or, or or whoever or the contractor, it's the developer that makes those decisions. They're the ones that take the risk. Jeremy, quick final thoughts. Yeah, I I'm not going to predict anything, but I'm very optimistic that the lumber pricing will normalize, will settle out, if the mills can come back online, which they will, and at some point in time. And uh, I'm hopeful. I'm not going to predict it, but I'm hopeful that here in the near future that will happen and stabilize some lumber pricing. Right. So short lumber uh, January contracts. You heard it here. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for this very news-relevant conversation. I think people out there really appreciate your insights. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.